Hey guys, today we're going to talk about a class of machines or a machine that I've been wanting to uh, go over. It's one of my favorites and one of my favorite classic PC eras and that's the 486. And that's the machine I have in front of you. This is my one of my 486s. Um, this is actually my main 486. I put this thing together. This is one of the computers I kind of learned about retro gaming on. Um, it was this and a, a Pentium 1 machine that I put together as my first DOS machines. And this I put this machine together pretty much piece by piece. You know, I got the case separate, the power supply separate, all the drives, all the internals, all the separate parts, and I put it together, and it, it was a good learning experience. Um, you know, the 486, it, it kind of covers that golden classic era in DOS gaming. It, it's capable enough that it can handle a very large array of games, but it, it still has that pre pentium you know, classic feel to it. Um, with this machine in particular, I went with compatibility over speed. This isn't a hot rod machine like I've shown before. This isn't like a 5x86. There's, it's not a PCI motherboard in there. Um, it's VLB, and we'll look at that in a minute. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, this is a 46 is, is a great kind of class of machine if you're just getting to DOS gaming. Um, you know, a little bit more advanced. There's a little bit more to it and a little bit more of a learning curve than with a Pentium machine. They're also a little bit harder to find now. You know, parts are getting a little bit rare, but not, not too much. It's not too much pricier than a Pentium machine, depending um, where you find it and stuff. But, yeah, it, it's just a fun machine to put. It's not so complex inside, you know, that it's, it's really hard for a novice to figure out, but it's a little bit more non-integrated, I guess you'd say, than a, uh, sort of like a Pentium machine enough. Although the motherboard in here, I have in here, does have uh, some integrated I.O. stuff. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, but yeah, this, this machine I, I put together, you know, it's got... I wanted a big, it's a bigger case, so it's tall, it has three uh, five and a quarter inch slots and then two, um, bleh, well I can't think all of a sudden, I think three and a half inch slots and there's an internal bay too, but uh, yeah, I wanted a bigger case because I wanted to like fit everything in the kitchen sink in this, is kind of my main machine. Power button reset, of course a turbo button. Uh, it's funny, I, I don't use the turbo button a lot because I have so many machines from different eras, you know. Hitting the turbo button will slow it down so you can play, you know, like 286, 386 era games maybe. I think it slows it down to maybe a real slow 386, maybe slower, but I mean, when I, I first built this machine, I wanted that because I was kind of, you know, wasn't planning on hoarding old computers. Um, but I don't use it now because I don't need it because I have real 386, 8088s and stuff. But um, for someone that doesn't have a ton of room, it's a cool option, so look for turbo buttons. Yeah, but I'll go over the what I have installed here real quick. Of course, we have the floppy disk mainstays. You have a 1.44 megabyte floppy here. You have a 1.2 megabyte floppy drive here. Of course, for this era, you definitely want to have a CD drive, uh, CD-ROM drive installed. This is actually, ugh, excuse me, this is actually a rewritable drive. Anything, even DVD drives will work. It's not, I don't think, it's not going to be capable of playing a DVD, but it'll see it as like a CD drive. It, it'll work. It's just what I had at the time, and uh, I just never replaced it. It, it actually isn't too loud, so that's fine. Um, again, one of these, I love these. These are just removable hard drive bays. So I have a hard drive in there. If I want to swap it out, I just turn the key, pull it out. New drive, don't have to open a case. Although I do have two drives in here. I'll get into that. Um, and here's a zip drive, of course. I love to put zip drives in there. This, though, is not an IDE zip drive. This is a SCSI zip drive. Uh, it's faster. It's a little faster than an IDE drive. They're a little hard to find, though, especially with the white uh, faceplate. I paid maybe $20 just for this drive. I got a little bit lucky. Usually they... I don't know. It, it, took, me, it took me a month or two looking on eBay to find one, especially at a reasonable price. I don't know if that's changed much, but yeah, SCSI, seems like the SCSI uh, 100 megabyte internal drives are a little harder to find, um, but they're worth it in my opinion. And uh, you know, it frees up the IDE bus too, since a lot of times in this these machines you might only have two, two drives uh, that are available for max. For the IDE, I guess that four wouldn't be a big problem, but anyways, uh, let me show you the back. Hey, actually scratch that. I mean, the back's point, it's all the back is is some slots in the power supply. So I'm, I'm just going to go straight into uh, showing you the insides of this machine. 
And this this isn't a typical uh, 486 in the fact that it's pretty much loaded. Uh, I have filled pretty much every slot in this machine with you know whatever I could. Uh, so you know your average machine of the era uh, isn't going to have that many cards. You don't if you want a fully functioning DOS retro machine, you're not going to need to stuff every slot with cards like I did. But if you want to kind of max out your setup. I'm gonna show you uh, what cards I have installed, so maybe you can use that as a basis to go from there, and with your priorities with the machine, you can decide what you wanna put in yours. Um, but I'm not gonna pull the whole motherboard out, so I'm gonna show you kind of a similar board, uh, which is right here. This is a typical uh, 486 board from the era. Um, You've got, you know, your 16-bit ISA slots. Some of them come with 8-bit slots. Uh, and what you really want in a 46 board, uh, if you're if you're just going with a 46, you're not going the PCI route and stuff. You want VLB slots. Uh, at least two of them. This board has three. The one in this machine has two. Two is fine for me. Actually, I wouldn't really recommend putting uh, using three or more. So I think you should stick with two. But uh, some boards you get are going to have more. Uh, VLB, it, it was a slot type that was only used on 46 class boards. They're really kind of tied to the processor uh, as local bus slots. And they're, they're kind of like the precursor to PCI. So they're kind of like pre-PCI slots. They're definitely faster than your ISA slots, um, your 16-bit. You can also use 16-bit ISA slots because the first half is just 16-bit uh, ISA and then this little brown extension part is the VLB part and added together um, but primarily they're like uh, IO controllers, SCSI controllers and video cards um, you really want a VLB video card for a 486 to really take full the full capacity of your processor here because um, they are faster um, yeah there's not, I mean this board doesn't have anything really integrated um, my board has integrated uh, IDE controller. This board does not. Um, usually, they're gonna you're gonna have an AT keyboard connector too. Um, L2 cache. Uh, for L2 cache on a 46, definitely go with 256k. You really don't need more than that. So let's let's look at what I have installed in this machine here. Before I take them out and show you though, I do want to show you the setup here. I have pretty much all of the slots filled up. Uh, real quick, I'll go over, I have a sound, there's a Sound Blaster card, I have a Gravis Ace that kind of complements the Sound Blaster card. Right here I have an MPEG uh, decoder, I'll go over that in a minute too. Uh, here's the video card, it's a VLB video card. Here is a VLB SCSI controller card, uh, I have it working alongside my onboard IDE. And then right here, this is a Roland uh, MIDI controller, I guess. It's a MIDI card for controlling uh, external MIDI devices. So I'm going to take these out and I'll show you exactly what's in them in a minute. And it will get you a little bit better look at this motherboard. Alright, so here I have the machine. This is with all the cards, the expansion cards removed. Again, I don't want to you know, take this whole board out, so uh, there's some stuff you're probably not going to perceive, but we all know it's there. So, uh, you know, first I want to talk about the processor. Uh, the CPU I used is just the classic uh, 66 megahertz Intel DX2. Uh, there are definitely faster 486 uh, processors out there. If you watched my high-end 486, uh, 5x86 machine, uh, build, you definitely know that. Uh, I love the 66 megahertz uh, Intel DX too. It's just, it's a great, I mean when I built this I wanted it, I was going for compatibility, uh, performance was was something I still wanted, uh, but I really wanted to capture the era uh, as well and nothing I think does that better than the 66 megahertz Intel DX2. It's just, it's the quintessential 46 in my opinion. It was very popular, um, you know, in the early 90s, mid 90s even for DOS, uh, it's just, it, it was kind of like the gamer's choice, very compatible, uh, it still has enough power to run, you know, some later stuff, it, it just covers the spectrum, it's just a great, reliable uh, CPU, they're easy to find, they're very abundant, pretty cheap. Um, 
This is kind of like a cool hefty duty cooler I have on it. I don't even think it requires a heat sink fan combo on it, but uh, I, in my opinion, you can never go overboard with cooling. So, uh, you also, I mean, again, I have a, like a case fan to blow the, the hot air away. It's, and a 46, even with all these cards, it's not generating a terrible amount of heat, but as again, I uh, said it before, you can't really go overboard with cooling. Um, so that's my CPU. The L2 cache, you can't see, it's under, uh, it's under these drives here. Uh, 256, I believe that's, that is the max for this board. Uh, that's kind of like the standard for most boards. I would, that's what I would shoot for. Don't, don't worry about 512, don't worry about a megabyte. Uh, you get diminishing returns after 256, it, it helps. Uh, but just stick with 256 kilobytes, it is really kind of like the standard. It, it won't, you, you know, you're not going to be losing performance really with that. Um, Anything, you know, 128, I think, is the one below. It's okay, but shoot for 256. Um, here, I don't know if you can really see it. This board, it's not super common on 46 boards, but this does have a built-in floppy and IDE controller. Uh, just one IDE port, so it's only controlling two IDE devices. Um, you can always get an IDE controller card, uh, disable the, if, you know, if you want more that, you know, probably handles four. Uh, I went with SCSI instead. I'll talk about that when I get to the card. Uh, RAM, again, I don't think you could see it, but it's right here. Uh, this machine, I have 16 megabytes. Uh, that's, I think it's 16. I haven't, I actually haven't booted this thing up. I look at my blog for the specifics. I cover this machine really well. I think, yeah, I think I have 16 or 32 in this machine. Um, actually, I'm I'm gonna say... Actually, I'm curious. Hold on. Okay, sorry guys. Major brain fart there. It's, I have 32 megabytes uh, built into this machine. I think at one time I had 16. That's where I was getting confused. Uh, that is the max for this board. Uh, some can go up to 64. I'll tell you, it's 30 pin sims, by the way. Uh, FPM, not EDO. This board doesn't support EDO. I'll tell you right now, that's overkill. I ran this machine for a good while uh, using 8 megabytes and then 16. And even with 8 megabytes, I have never ran into any issues. So, 32 is overkill. Um, but, you know, just I, just go with it. I really wouldn't, I wouldn't bother with 64 megabytes. Nothing's really going to need that or take advantage of it. Uh, so just, 32 is good enough. But you're, if you only have 8 megabytes, you're still good to go. 8 or 16, don't worry about that too much. Um, uh, right here, these are just COM ports, uh, parallel, and two serial ports. Those are also built into the board, so I didn't need any kind of card for that. Um, you can see there's an internal bay for one of the uh, hard drives, as well as the hard drive I have installed uh, in that, ex that removable bay. Uh, the hard drive I have in the removable bay is an IDE hard drive. I believe it's 504 megabytes, and it's running off the onboard controller as well as the CD-ROM drive. This one here is a 2 gigabyte SCSI controller and I'm actually getting the full 2 gigabytes uh, space by using a SCSI controller. Um, the SCSI controller I have controlling this and the zip drive. So uh, now that we've kind of take look, uh, had an overlook at the board, I don't, ha I don't know the board, this board uh, name off the top of my head but check out the blog. I'll put a link and uh, I have specifics on this mo particular motherboard and all the cards and everything actually it's far more detailed than this video so let's go over the cards uh, quick yeah, not too quick but uh, first I'm gonna go over that SCSI controller I was talking about and this is it let me zoom out a little bit so this is a SCSI controller and as you can tell by the length it is a VLB SCSI controller I would recommend uh, going with AdaptTech or BusLogic. This is a BusLogic. I had an AdaptTech controller and it just didn't work. Um, I don't know if it was conflicting my setup or whatever or if it, you know, maybe it was a faulty card. I haven't had any trouble with this. Um, and this runs perfectly well alongside the IDE controller. Um, so SCSI, it's just, I mean, it supports more device. It's a little bit more of a hassle to set up SCSI, and the drives and whatnot are a little more expensive, maybe a little harder to find. But once you do have it set up, they are faster. The SCSI drive's a little bit faster, a little more reliable once you have it going. Um, 
and you can hook up to it's at least seven devices there's an external so I could get like an external SCSI uh, CD-ROM drive or whatever hook it up <laughs> probably chain a couple of them chain a couple more hard drives externally and it shouldn't be a problem this card also has a floppy controller I'm not using it though um, got dip switches to set settings if you know when you get one you're gonna have to do some experimenting hopefully of a manual or something that will tell you because um, you're gonna have to set it up correctly uh, that might be another video this one though has talks about some of the switches um, and it also depends on uh, your CPU speed you know that's why that's another reason I like the uh, DX2 the 33 or the 66 because the front side bus on this machine is 33 megahertz and 33 megahertz front side bus doesn't really give any of your expansion cards any problems uh, you know you can put two VLB cards no problem now if I was running it like 40 front side bus I might not be able to run two uh, VLB cards because it might give it problems. So keep that in mind. Uh, th I think the 33 megahertz front side bus is more than enough for 46. Uh, if you're playing, you know, for not high end DOS, you know, late era stuff. Uh, but it's good for the bulk of it and it keeps things very stable. Uh, and that was one of my priorities with this machine was stability, compatibility, stability, uh, whatnot. So let's look at my other. VLB card I have and this is the video card and here it is you can tell from its length it's VLB and the card I'm using is it uses the Sung or Sang uh, ET4000 chip uh, W32P and I have uh, two megabytes it come this card came with one megabyte I upgraded mine to two megabytes I wouldn't fret too much about uh, the megabyte numbers um, one, I you know, is kind of the standard. Two, I think it just helps with resolutions. It, higher resolution doesn't really help that much with speed. Uh, so don't worry. If you have a one megabyte card, that's fine. I went with the uh, the ET4000 because it's it's largely seen as the fastest uh, card for DOS, uh, 2D DOS. There's some debate about that. Uh, there might be some more exotic cards, but this if it's not the fastest, it is one of the fastest. And it's not too terribly hard to find. Um, originally, I had a VLB Trident card. It was kind of like, ugh. And then I had a Speedster that had a Cirrus Logic chip in it, and it was fine. That card, I still have that. I have that in another machine. That, that card was fine. Um, but this was just kind of like to get as a bump up. I think I paid 40 for it. They're, they're, they can be a little expensive, uh, so keep that in mind. A little hard to find. I had to wait a while for one to pop up on eBay at an acceptable price. I think I actually paid less than 40. I'm in 30 something, but these can go for a bit. They can be hard to find. Uh, but yeah, VLB ET4000 card is, you know, if you want kind of the best or close to the best, I'd go with one of these. So that's my video card. So along with video, this, I'll show you my newest card. Uh, I actually haven't even updated the blog entry on with this card yet, but I will maybe today or tomorrow. And that is an MPEG decoder. Um, this is complete, like, you know, optional luxury-ish card. You do not need this for a setup. I don't even know if I will ever use this card. Uh, <laughs> but basically what it does, it allows something like a 486 that doesn't have the processing power to process something like MPEG video and allows it to. Um, I'd go with the Real Magic. Uh, this is an EM7110. Uh, there's other, you know, any of the EM7000 cards. Uh, the reason I put this in, I don't do like, you know, MPEG editing or anything, but the reason I put it in is because there are a couple games, and when I say a couple, I mean three or four, maybe more, that utilize these cards uh, for with their MPEG video in the game, like the FMV, and it just, it's smoother, makes the video smoother, maybe more animations. I don't know a lot about it, um, you know, some of the games like Dragon's Quest, Space Ace, The Horde, uh, maybe a couple more. Uh, they're not easy to come across those versions. So, like I said, I don't even know if I'll utilize this card, but I just, I had an empty slot, so I wanted it in there. Um, this card uses kind of like the Voodoo. I, I think, you know, you have your video card, it goes into here, and then you have a special dongle, which I still need to get, actually. And I think that outputs to the monitor, um, something like that. But it is a pass-through. There are cards that have an internal uh, pins for VESA, I think, and it can they can internally connect to your video card. Uh, I heard those, the picture you get from them is better, but they're a little less compatible. 
So again, I went with compatibility and I went with one that just uses an external pass through. Um, so that's what that is. So really all that's left now is sound. Um, so this is what I went with for sound. For a 46 era machine, you can't really go wrong with your tried and true Sound Blaster 16. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's it's not the greatest car. It doesn't sound the best, but it's pretty much compatible with anything uh, DOS. It is like the de facto DOS card. Some people prefer the sound, older Sound Blaster Pro 2.0 because it sounds a little better and it's a little bit more compatible with older stuff, I believe. Uh, but I just went with the Sound Blaster 16. Uh, beware, most of these have a hanging MIDI bug. Um, I get around that certain some ways. I, I haven't. Real with this card, this is a CT2900. Um, you know, I don't use it for MIDI anymore, so I don't have to worry about the hanging note bug. But keep that in mind if this is your sole card and you're using uh, MIDI modules through you know external MIDI modules or you're using a Wave Blaster card, uh, they are going to have a hanging MIDI bug problem. Uh, you'll just have to look that up. I'm not going to go into that now. I do have one video showcasing it, um, kind of the problem with it. So uh, try to look at that. If I can figure out how to link to it or something, I will in the video. But yeah, I just Sound Blaster 16. You know, they're really abundant. Um, every game supports them. This is using a Viber chip because I think the Viber chip, some people don't like them. I think they have a little bit clearer output. Um, you know, so this is just what I use for FM. You want to make sure it has a real FM chip though. Like right here it says uh, F Yamaha OPL. You just you want a card for your FM synth that has a real FM chip. So now the reason I'm not worried about the hanging MIDI bug is because I'm using one of these, and this is a uh, this is a MIDI uh, card. Uh, MPU IPCT. This is for this is Roland. Uh, you know, you have a, a special box that connects. I have it over there. Maybe I'll grab it uh, in a second. But you use this card to it just. This is just a MIDI interface card. I, this card is just for interfacing with external modules like the MT32, uh, CM32L. I, mean, I know that M. Any, anyways, general MIDI modules, external modules. Um, this this is pretty much flawless. It's 8-bit, uh, but this I've had no trouble with this X. Yeah, um, blah, blah, sorry, using it to communicate with external boxes. Actually, I have one sitting uh, over here. This is what it connects to. Um, this plugs into your card. And then this, you need a MIDI cable. <laughs> and then the MIDI cable comes out of this and it goes into your like MT32 or whatever and then you get, uh, you know, MIDI music, which is far superior in most cases to FM. Um, I have an MT32 over here, but I don't really feel like dragging it over. Uh, lastly, I have this. And this is also, this is just a luxury. You do not need this. This is a Gravis Ace. Um, this is not, I mean, there are Gravis ultrasound cards, and uh, they do sound better in most cases than a Sound Blaster 16, pretty much far superior, uh, but not every game supports them. Um, so I got this. This is the Ace, and what, what this is, is the Ace was built to install into a computer alongside a Sound Blaster card. So uh, you install this, and you use a... Uh, leave an audio jack to uh, connect them. And anyways, you know, most of your games uh, that you're using your Sound Blaster 16, and then if you have a game that uses the, uh, that has, supports the all Gravis Alter Sound, um, then you can set it up, you know, as long as the cards aren't conflicting and you set it up right, it will use a Gravis ultrasound. <laughs> so basically this is just a kind of a cut down ultrasound to work alongside a Sound Blaster 16 as I've said before. So you can have the best of both worlds. Um, this is version 1.0. It has a few problems. Uh, I think the stereo output is switched. Um, there's You can work around that. It's not a big deal. And also you can't disable, even though there's not a joystick port on here, uh, the internals think there is and that can be a conflict. Uh, but there's a patch to fix that. Uh, check out my blog. I have I've written up about that, and I think I have a link to the utility. 
that you can use to turn off uh, the internal joystick thing. But this is kind of a neat uh, little add-on thing. Um, they're kind of expensive. I think I paid around 100 bucks for this card. Um, sometimes they're more. Uh, they can be hard to come across. So just, you know, if you want one, be diligent. So that's about it. Um, like I said, you know, it's not too hard to put together. It's a real fun learning experience if you're just getting into this kind of thing. And I really recommend uh, getting a 46. But one more thing I didn't quite. This, if you're wondering what this is, this is just a battery. Um, it had a barrel battery in it at one point. Uh, like this. I hate these things. They leak over time and you have to solder them in and out and it's really inconvenient. Uh, so I just, I like external batteries. Uh, you just, there should be, most boards have a little uh, place for you to put them in, pins. And yeah, it's, it's just, it's an external battery. And when this dies, you just pump, get a new one, plug it in, you're good to go. I haven't used it. I, I kind of just have mine laying in there, but you can, there's a little Velcro thing so you can have it stuck, which is convenient. I don't know why I haven't. Um, but I think we're going to show some, I'll show you some gameplay footage of a couple games running on this machine. So, but other than that, that's pretty much the bulk of this video. So, I hope it helps you out if you're uh, looking into building a 46. I really highly recommend it. You do not have to go with a billion cards like I did. You'll be good, you know, with a one megabyte VLB video card. Maybe an IDE uh, I.O. controller if you don't have one built in, and a Sound Blaster 16, 8 to 16 megabytes of RAM, you'll be good to go. Um, I, you know, I'd go with, you don't even need like an ET4000, uh, you don't really need it, uh, but that's just kind of like the higher end one if you want to go all out. But, you know, with a Cirrus Logix VLB card, uh, like a Diamond Speedster or Speedster Pro, you're good to go. So that's my overview of my machine, so I hope you enjoyed it.
Jones. How are you going to find that statue and all this junk? 